Anytime we sin, it is a breaking of God's commandment. And we know that sin begins with a single thought because Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11 prove this. And we're not going to spend a lot of time here because I want to discuss something else as well. But Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, we discussed this before. Jesus Christ is baptized according to oneness. Apparently, God is a very twilight twist, and he, Jesus Christ threw his voice. And I'm just making that up. Really, they, because they, well, they believe in one God. You have a voice speaking from heaven. The Holy Ghost coming down and up. Something has to be going on there with Jesus Christ projecting his voice of it. There's only if he is God and there isn't the Father and or the Holy Ghost. But regardless, moving on, since that went over like a lead balloon. Matthew chapter 4, 1 and through 11. Jesus Christ is baptized, driven into the wilderness by the Holy Ghost. And there he is fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And who should appear unto him? Satan. Satan. And Satan comes down and he whispers it. Well, he doesn't necessarily whisper, but he dares it. And he says, how about turning these stones into bread and eating? And Christ rejects him. Does the devil force himself upon Christ and force Christ to do anything? No. What does he do? He implants a thought. Why don't you just do this? And Christ resists him. And the devil flees. Does the devil stay away? No. no. He comes back to business a second time. I'm trying to remember the second one, but I don't. I might got it mixed up. But regardless, he implants a thought again. Oh, second one. He takes him up to a high pinnacle of temporal and dares him to throw himself to the ground and challenges him to send legions of angels to catch him. Prove himself as God. Christ resists them. Does the devil stop there? No. Nope. He shows up again. And he dares Christ and takes him to a high mountain and says, all these countries and these nations will be yours. And what does Christ do again? Yep. But he resists. And what happens to the devil? He goes bye-bye. He flees. Devil at no point in time ever forced himself upon Christ and forced Christ to do anything. He constantly implanted a thought. Well, how about this? How about this? How about this? He never forced Christ to do anything. The same is true with us, regardless of whether you're a believer or a non believer. It all begins with a single thought. Devil can't force us to do anything, but he can implant that single thought. And if we dwell on that thought, it will grow and it will become lust. And eventually, we will act upon it. But if we do the biblical method as Christ has shown us, we know the devil's going to come against us. We know it. We're not idiots. We're not ignorant of his devices. He is going to come and tempt each one of us. I can guarantee you, Uncle Doug, he's going to come at you, whether it's today, tomorrow, a week from now. The devil's going to come at you with something. He's got to come at all of us with something. The question is us. What are we going to do with it? Are we going to use the biblical method of resist the devil and he will flee? Or will we act upon it? But it all comes down to a single thought. The devil does not necessarily attack our body right away. He goes for the mind. That is the strongest. That is the central point right there. If he can get you to think it, and if he can get you to act upon it, he's got you. But it's a matter of getting you to dwell upon it. Thoughts will come. It's a matter of we resist or not. Going from there, our mind is the battlefield. We all know that. But there are things in society that the devil has prepped in that we may not be aware of. Let me go back to my first page. I have a quote. G.K. Chesterton stated this, Merely having an open mind is nothing. The object of opening the mind, as of the opening of the mouth, is to shut it again on something solid. Society teaches us to have an open mind. It doesn't tell us what to grasp. Actually, it does. It tells us to grasp those things that the world wants us to grasp. Evolution. Humanism. But if you are a Christian and you know the Word of God, 
and you're not open to their theories, guess what? You're closed-minded. No. We are not to be open-minded that we are to receive everything. In fact, that's how the devil gets us. I don't know if you all have heard of, what was it, the Amityville, Amityville Horror, the house that was demon-possessed, or there they said that, I was watching a documentary that mom recorded for me on uh, possession while we're here and I'm thinking of it. Think about this thought, can a Christian be demon-possessed? I know we've talked about it, but let's talk about why as well. That's going to be next week if, I, if I'm thinking correctly. So we'll have an open discussion on that. But the Amityville Park, from what I understand, the movie itself portrayed a uh, madman who hunted Indians and killed them in his basement. The boy, they interviewed on there the boy who actually lived there during the hauntings, if you want to call that, and we'll talk about ghosts later on too. I have a whole lot of lists to talk about. But regardless, he said that that was not a true accurate portrayal. But rather, his father practiced something that was called transcendentalism. And in it, you sit down, you free your mind, and you chant out a name. And it's the name of a demon. He said that's how the house actually got haunted. It was actually a demon. The house itself contained a demon. And it all came back to the fact that his father practiced transcendentalism. Which, when you get down to it, is a practice of Eastern um, mysticism, Eastern religion, and Buddhism. That practices from way over there in their call of idolatry. There's another thing called astral projection. There's a gentleman who is into this stuff as well. This is also part of Eastern mysticism. Where he sat down, he designed a room for himself where he could sit down and just meditate and free his mind. And over time, he put different objects in there, just like triangles and just different shapes. And I, if I remember correctly, it came to a point that he would go in there for hours and hours and just free his mind and just whatever would come in, come in. And there he seen, if I remember correctly, it was either a big old um, bright disc or it was actually a big old smiley face. And it kept coming towards him. It was something that drew him. And he would just go closer to it, closer to it, until finally, and the man wasn't saved at all, but God intervened and showed this man what was actually behind this big old disc or a smiley face, whatever it was. And it was horrible creatures. It was demons. And demons were coming, and God showed him that if he went, kept going towards it, these demons were going to attack him. We wouldn't practice something outright like that, would we? But what if it was disguised in the form of yoga? I mean, they bring these things into our society. They seem innocent. But what's the whole goal of yoga? You sit down, you meditate, you free your mind. Yes, I realize they have stretches and that kind of stuff. But it's all about freeing yourself. Whatever comes into your mind, allow it. We want to practice something that we would know it would be connected to other religions. Do they promote yoga as being connected to other religions? No. But if you start studying Buddhism and Eastern religions, we find that that's a practice that they use. They may not call it yoga. We may call it yoga. But it's still an Eastern religion. And it's all about freeing your mind. Just allow whatever comes into your mind to come. We need to be careful with our minds. We need to be careful with what society produces and says is all right. Because in the end, it could get us demon possessed. It could lead to oppression if you're a Christian. We need to guard ourselves. And we can't go by what society teaches is right or normal. But we need a question, okay, where does this come from? Is this all right? Could this some, is this something that could harm me? Going back, or even my family, going back to the Amityville um, horror in the documentary there, the boy, um, boy's now grown up. Is he saved? I don't know. There was no implication that he was. But he said to this day, he claims that that demon that his father chanted and haunted the house is stalking him. 
No, the spirit realm is real. And we need to be careful what we open ourselves up to. And we need to be careful. Because as we already proved today, society and the world in general is not true. It is not honest. It is not pure. But we need to watch ourselves and we need to guard our minds. And the more we look and study, we see that the mind is truly the battle. And the devil does not always come with a loaded cannon blatantly and view Sister Jan. But he might come and disguise it somehow. I don't know. Fake it like a Trojan horse who in disguise like a cute little fluffy rabbit with an open mouth gets close enough and all of a sudden the cannon goes off. I don't know. But the devil will use, if we want to put in those terms, Trojan horses. Things that will seem innocent, that will bring into our camp. But as soon as the moment is right, it will strike and it will destroy us. We need to be careful and guard our minds. Any thoughts, any questions?